celebrating 14 years. Just out of curiosity, how many of you were part of Gateway South back when we met at Covington Middle School? Just raise your hand. All right, several of us. Okay. Yeah, we were in that middle school for, I think, five, maybe six years. That's way too long to be in middle school. But it was a great beginning. That's when we arrived. My family got here about year three. Most churches don't make it uh, five years, and we're 14 years old. Um, I, I got here in year three, and it was already a vibrant and healthy community. And, and then we moved to Crockett High School. How many of you started coming when we were at Crockett High School? All right, yeah, several of you. Excellent. So you remember we graduated up to a high school, and we were right across the street from Austin Community College, but we never quite made it to college. Instead, we came here. And in this building, uh, we've been here five years. How many of you started coming uh, kind of two, three years ago? Yeah? Two, three. How many of you have just started coming during the pandemic? You've never been here without having to wear a mask. Anyone? All right, a few of you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, one day you'll get to see the smiles on our faces. And we look forward to those moments in the future. What was crazy about this space that we're in is actually we had come here in 2012 because we were really outgrowing the middle school, not the auditoriums per se, but the parking lot. Not a lot of middle schoolers drive to school, and there wasn't enough space for all of us to park our cars. And so we started looking, and we came here in 2012, and they were eager to let us rent the entire 40,000 square feet. But we didn't need all 40,000 square feet. And so we kept looking, and that's when we moved to Crockett High School. And, and then we circled back a couple years later. And at that point, they were talking to Altitude. And they needed somebody that wanted 20,000 square feet. And so we prayed about it. We talked about it as a, as a church family. And, and we estimated we'd need about $800,000 to, to renovate this place. Because for about six years, this was just an empty space. It, it, was, it was when we first got here, there were dead animals in this building. It, 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 for a while, it was, had been an HEB. Then it became an Albertsons. And then it was like this renaissance fair of like 200 different businesses, and then it was just nothing for six years. And you gave generously and, and helped create a, a new space, repurposed space to bring life and freedom to South Austin. South Austin, by the way, is where Keep Austin Weird originated. Austin, if you don't know this, South Austin in particular is known as the church planter's graveyard. A lot of people have tried to plant churches here with this idea, if you build it, they will come. And that's actually not what happens in South Austin. Less than 10% of people in South Austin go to a church on a Sunday morning. And so those of you who've been here a long time, you've actually done something really significant. This is really remarkable that this place even exists, that we've been able to meet together all this time. And our original plan when we were going to come in, we have this garage door over here. See, originally we had this taco truck. It was actually a snow cone machine we turned into a taco truck. And we'd make tacos every Sunday over at Crockett High School. And so our plan was to move the taco truck into the lobby and just keep making tacos. But when we started and we raised all the money that we thought we needed, and then the city of Austin came and told us, uh-uh, you're going to need more bathrooms. And we were disappointed, but you know what? I'm glad. You know, having enough bathrooms is important. But once we had to build all those bathrooms, then we went ahead and built a kitchen, right? And so in order to do that, we had to basically borrow some money from Gateway's Reserves. Our, our, our church is one of many campuses. And this year, we will have paid off everything. This will be completely paid off. Isn't that amazing? And it's been exciting. And, and certainly, all that's really amazing. And the first Sunday, it was kind of a crazy experience because we were trying to move in in 2015, and then it looked like, okay, maybe, maybe by Easter 2016. And, and literally, we, we moved all of our stuff out of Crockett High School. We had it all in trailers, and, and we just needed permission to unload in this building. And you need something called a temporary occupancy permit. And there's just a few people in the city that can give you permission to do that. And one of them happened to live next door to a woman that was part of Gateway South. And apparently she would bang on his door every few days. Hey, have you gone by my church? Have you given us permission yet? She was a sweet, sweet nag. And, uh, and he literally came the Friday before Palm Sunday that year. It was uh, 
March, it came at like 4.45 on Friday afternoon, and we got permission. All our stuff was in the trailer, and that Sunday we got permission. We were able to meet here for the first time, March 20th, 2016. And I tell you, a space is a beautiful gift from God, but, but that's not the church. The people that are part of this community, well, those watching online, those of you here in this room, we are the church. And what's been so beautiful is to see how God has used you and this space to bring hope and life and healing. Right on that wall, right back there, we wrote the names of neighbors and family members and friends that we hoped would one day find what we've discovered in having faith in Jesus. And we've seen so many of them. By the way, we painted over the names so you can't go see them. But they're behind that gray paint, those black panels. And to see people that I love step into this space and find faith, just as we prayed all those years ago. It's down this hallway where children have discovered that God loves them, where teenagers have realized that God has a plan for their life and his ways are better than the temptations of the world. It's in this lobby that college students and young adults and, and singles have even met and ended up getting married eventually. We've had some that have been healed in their marriage, some that have found faith and gotten baptized right out in the lobby. We've seen so many remarkable things, people finding healing as they go through recovery. We've had multicultural dinners where we've shared our grandmother's recipes with each other. It's been such an incredible time as we've experienced God's presence, as we've mourned with those who mourned, as we celebrated with those who celebrated, as we dedicated children and their parents. And it's just hard to believe the impact that we've had together. And I tell you all of this to say the reason why so many people work so hard and serve so hard and give so much all these years, creating this place for you and me, is because of Jesus. Because we've discovered that he is the one who brings healing and hope and that he is alive and that he is actively still at work in every human being and any who are willing to listen will find him. And so today we continue this series that will conclude next week on Easter Sunday as we talk about and and try to answer the question, who is Jesus really? And we're not wanting to just go with the preconceived notions that you might have. We don't want to go with just what others have said about him. We want to encourage you to go to what he actually said about himself. And we've looked at how there were these seven statements in the eyewitness account written by John. It's called the Gospel of John. I encourage you, if you've never read it, whether you've followed God for a long time or you're not even sure about God, just with an open heart and open mind, just begin reading that, just one chapter a day, and just pray, God, if you're real, show me who you are and show me who you want me to be. And just read a chapter a day and just let God reveal himself to you. And we we see as seven different statements, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In other words, he's saying that God is the one who sustains the one who provides. He said, I am the light of the world. In other words, God is the one who guides us in the darkness. He said, I am the gate. God is the one who protects. I am the good shepherd. God is our father. And today we're looking at two other times that were even more explicit when Jesus was claiming to be God. And so the context here is is the religious leaders are wanting to trap Jesus in his words because he has disrupted so much. Earlier in John chapter 8, there's this beautiful story where these really mean religious leaders have caught this woman in the act of adultery, and they, they don't take the guy involved. They just take her, and they throw her in front of Jesus, and they're holding stones ready to throw them at her. And they ask Jesus what he says they should do. And he just writes in the ground. We're unsure what he wrote. Could be he began writing the names of those holding the rocks. Could be he was writing down a picture of the cross that would soon hold him. Could be he was writing down the sins of those holding those rocks. All we know is he said, whoever has never sinned, 
Let him be the first one to throw a rock. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their rocks and walked away. And he looked at this woman and said, who condemns you? And she says, there's no one here anymore. And he says, well, neither do I condemn you. But now go and leave your life of sin. You can lead a new life. You don't have to get trapped in those same predicaments over and over. And so the religious leaders are angry at him. And so they look for an opportunity to catch him, to turn the crowd against him. And so they see Jesus at the temple courts and they confront him. And it's in the midst of this confrontation as they've been talking to him about the Jewish law, about history and tradition, that they bring up the patriarch himself. They bring up the person of Abraham. So we know as we look at the Hebrew scriptures that God chose Abraham and through him, he would bless him and make a great nation. And that nation would bless all the nations, every people group across the planet. That nation became known as Israel. And so these Jewish leaders looked up to Abraham. They saw him as the patriarch, the founding father of their faith. And then Jesus looks at these leaders and he tells them that they are not children of Abraham. Instead, they are children of Satan filled with his lies and deceit, that they are murderers who are just looking for an opportunity to kill him. Well, you can imagine these religious leaders are triggered. <laughs> no one likes to be confronted back when they confront you. But Jesus stood there and they asked him this question in John chapter 8. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think they who do you think you are? They are not pleased. And this question posed by the religious leaders of the day expects a, a, a no response. That, that Jesus would say, of course, I'm not greater than Abraham. But that's exactly what he was claiming. He was claiming to be greater than Abraham. But, you know, if you listen closely to what Jesus has been saying all along, he's been saying he's greater than a lot of really important people. To the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he said, when asked, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from himself? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. In other words, I have, worse, I have water that if you were to drink it, you would never thirst, that I have something better than what Jacob had to offer. In Matthew 12, Jesus says, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Or in John chapter 5, Jesus says, I have testimony weightier than John, John the Baptist, for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. Or in Matthew 12, Jesus says, the queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is saying, he is greater than Jacob, he's greater than Jonah, than John the Baptist, than King Solomon, he's greater than Abraham. This is shaking the religious leaders. This is turning everything upside down. They did not expect this. But listen to his response when they asked if he's greater than Abraham. He replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Well, they're completely confused. They say, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. You might say, Jesus made a generic statement about being the I am. What's the big deal? But you can see in their reaction, this was a very big deal to the religious leaders. We've seen in the series that Jesus was far bolder than you might have thought. If you've ever heard someone say that Jesus never claimed to be God, they've not actually read what Jesus had to say. They haven't read the eyewitness accounts. 
these religious leaders, you can tell by how furious they were that what he was saying is that I am God, the pre-existent one. I am Yahweh. See, that word Yahweh is the Hebrew phrase for I am. I am the one who was and is and is to come. It comes from this moment when Moses was attempting to free his people, the Israelites, from slavery. And he sees this burning bush, and he goes to this bush, and hears God's voice. Here's the interaction. Moses said to God in Exodus 3, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. See, Jesus' words were incredibly clear. He is saying, I am the Messiah, the promised one, and the Father and I are one. I am God. He's invoking the same name as God. Jesus is saying that he is in God and God is in him, that they are one. But you can imagine why this was difficult for these religious leaders to hear. I mean, they were in charge. When, when people are in power, it's important to maintain the status quo. And so Jesus was disrupting all of that. Jesus was saying that you didn't need to go through the religious leaders to get to God. You didn't have to obey their commands. Instead, you can come to him. And God is a God of grace and kindness and love and forgiveness, a God who doesn't condemn but who rescues. See, they didn't know how the Messiah was going to act. They thought he would be coming in on a, a horse ready to defeat the Roman oppressors. But instead, on this day, 2,000 years ago, on Palm Sunday, he came in riding a donkey. A donkey, not a, not a horse like a warrior, but a donkey. Now, in many ways, that represents two different things. One, that he was coming in to the city as a servant. And we know this, looking back, it's easier for us to see it because we know the rest of the story. But see, a donkey in the Middle East wasn't like a mule. It wasn't, it wasn't just something that kind of worked the farm. It was like what you had if you couldn't get a horse. A donkey had regal implications. See, a king would ride on a donkey into the city. He was coming in as king, but a servant king. So different than what they could have ever imagined. See, Jesus challenged the status quo. He challenged the religious leaders. And so they were faced with this moment where they had to decide, either we need to believe him or get rid of him. And they grabbed rocks to throw at him. It's important to remember, too, that the Hebrew people don't say the name of God, even to this day. The, the term Yahweh, in their scriptures, they actually took the word. And so that when you're reading it, and they read from right to left, when you're reading it, they actually put the vowels of another word, Adonai, so that when they saw the word Yahweh, they wouldn't actually say it out loud. See, God is too holy for them to say the name out loud, so instead they would say the Lord, which is Adonai. And when you take Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, and the vowels of Adonai, it actually creates a new word, Jehovah, if you've ever heard that word. See, they would say the names of God. They, they would say names like El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, or Elohim, the force above all other forces, or Hashem, the personal experiential God, or Adonai, God is my Lord. But Jesus did not use those names. He said the equivalent of Yahweh, I am. So these religious leaders had a hard time coming to terms with Jesus saying this. 
Some of you might know Ben Petrie. He was our drummer for many years here at Gateway South. Now he's helping out at Gateway Buda. And apparently he said this this week. When the religious leaders of the day were like, no way, Jesus was like, Yahweh. <laughs> I gave him credit in case you didn't like that. It is a little cheesy. But it's important to know that as Jesus was saying to the religious leaders that he is the I am, the one who was and is and is to come in the flesh walking among us, you should also know that the Greeks and Romans who were also in earshot of Jesus, believed that all, of behind of human, all behind human history was this great force called the logos, knowledge or the word. At the beginning of the eyewitness account of his life, John writes that in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the word is Jesus. Not only was he telling the religious leaders that he is the one who was and is and is to come. But he was saying to the Gentile world, to the Greeks and the Romans, that the word had become flesh, that he is the logos, the knowledge behind all that we experience in life. He is the I am. One of the things that we have seen in this series is that Jesus is far bolder than we might realize. And too often, the, our view of Jesus is too small. Even those of us who follow Jesus, sometimes we just look to him as a, as a healer or as a great teacher, a, 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 someone who's there for the outcast. And he is all of those things, but he's so much more. Don't allow your presuppositions, your preconceived notions, your assumptions to limit who Jesus should be and can be in your life. Why is this important for us? Well, we can see it in the last meal that he had shared with his disciples, which was 2,000 years ago this week. This week, we celebrate the week known as the Passion or Holy Week, the week leading up to Easter. Jesus knew that his time had come, that it was time to give up his life, to complete his mission, to die for the sake of humanity. And in the midst of that, he's trying to comfort his disciples who'd walked with him for two to three years. That even though he was about to leave them, that, that his spirit would come and actually be closer to them than he ever could be physically. And it's in the midst of that fear that he was about to leave them that he said these words, John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to, to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. See, the reason for us to do this scriptural exercise in reading is to then set up this most practical part of how we walk with Jesus. If we take Jesus at who he says he is, there's a logical progression to following God. See, Jesus is saying, the I am is the way. The I am is the truth. The I am is the life. So let's just do a quick personal assessment. If you're here and you, and you follow Jesus, when it comes to Jesus being the way in your life, when it comes to making decisions, how often are you looking to, to God, to Jesus, to the Spirit of God to guide you in your decision making? Versus how often are you just doing what think, you think is best or following the ways of this world? Zero percent means you don't even consider what God would want. A hundred percent means in every decision you are being led by God to know the way. Eugene Peterson, he's the one who wrote the version of the Bible called The Message. 
He said this, to follow Jesus implies that we enter into a way of life that is given character and shape and direction by the one who calls us. Are you allowing Jesus to give character and shape and direction to your life every day throughout the day? In Isaiah chapter 55, we read that God is saying that our ways are not his ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Doesn't it make sense that we would rely on him to make decisions? In fact, the scriptures are clear and just experience can tell you that we can't trust our ways, our thoughts, our emotions. Because there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death, as it says in Proverbs 14, 12. See, taking our thoughts and emotions and and bringing them before the Lord and letting God guide us to make those decisions, to know the right way to go. Second, the I am is the truth. For the truth, when it comes to discerning what is happening in your world, how often are you looking to Jesus to discern the truth versus how often are you getting sucked into the lies, either lies you believe about yourself or others or lies you're believing fed to you by the world. See, in order to walk according to the truth, you need accountability in your life. You need people in your life, people who love you enough to point out blind spots that you can't see. See, when we do this 100% of the time, when we're walking in truth, it means that we're walking with humility. We're spending time with God in the scriptures and prayer and worship, and we're in community where others are able to guide us and help us along the way. There's a beautiful verse, Psalm 86, that says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Talking about those who follow him, Jesus said, They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth, God. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Randy Alcorn, an author and pastor, said this, Truth is far more than facts. It's not just something we act upon. It acts upon us. We can't change the truth, but the truth can change us. It sanctifies or sets us apart from the falsehoods woven into our sin natures. See, when you and I become followers of Jesus... There's an internal battle within us between the spirit and the sinful nature, this part of us that's broken because we live in a broken world. And what's beautiful is he helps us become more and more who God created us to be, but there's always going to be a battle on this side of eternity. We have to let the old lies, the old patterns, the old names that we allowed into our brain to permeate us, melt away that we might know the truth about us, about others, about God, who is truth. And finally, the I am is the life. For the life, when it comes to transformation, how often are we experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus has promised? It means being transformed and bringing transformation to others. 100% means you and I are experiencing the fruit of the Spirit, like we talked about last week, when Jesus said, I am the true vine, the Spirit The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Your life begins to permeate these beautiful spiritual qualities. And you bring those qualities into your relationships, helping others experience that new life. So you and I are invited to come to God that he might show us the way that he might be our truth and give us life. The song the band is going to sing gives us an opportunity to connect our hearts to God. Wherever you may be today, I just want to encourage you, just open your heart and your mind and just pray, God, is there any part of me that, that I'm doing my own thing, that I am not entrusting to you, that needs to die so that I can truly live? God's love for you is big. His love is so big that he gives you and I the freedom to choose whether or not we will trust him, whether or not we will follow him, not just into eternity that he might rescue us for all eternity, but every single moment of every day. He wants to guide you. He wants to lead you. He wants to heal you and give you the power to bring healing to your relationships and to others.
So during this song, if you know it, you can sing it out as a prayer or just allow the lyrics to bathe over your heart and make it your declaration to God. Listen to these lyrics or sing along.